Hello, everyone. Um, I have the honor today to interview Dr. John DiMartini. Um, he's a world-renowned human behavior specialist um, traveling the world, teaching his amazing um, wisdom and uh, knowledge. And he used to be a chiropractor as well, um, working with the mind-body connection. And uh, I had the honor to um, learn in the last six years from you, John. Um, I can only tell that um, I really uh, it really changed my life and um, you inspired me um, very much and so today we will speak about the mind-body connection especially how it relates to um, back pain and the spine so um, first of all again thank you so much for taking the time um, to do the interview with me and um, can you start by giving us a little introduction into how the mind-body connection works So, at one time, there was a belief that the body and the mind were not necessarily inseparable. And many people did not acknowledge the psychology as impacting the body as now science has demonstrated. But with every perception that we have, um, all perceptions boil down to ratios of prey and predator. In other words, if we, if we perceive something that supports what we value in life and supports our life, in other words, we tend to associate it with prey, food, that allows us to build our body and to sustain ourselves. Anything that challenges us, that is kind of a distress initiator, uh, we tend to think of as uh, a predator. And our primitive part of our brain, you might say, or at least the subcortical area of our brain, an older region of our brain, is involved in responses of either rest and digest towards the prey or fight or flight towards the predator. And each of those activate inside our autonomic nervous system, which is our involuntary nervous system, responses of either parasympathetic for the rest and digest or sympathetic for fight or flight. Those autonomic divisions uh, release neurotransmitters in the brain and into the body through the circulatory system and through the fluid systems. They go on to cell receptors, and the cell receptors create a secondary messenger response that then cause a cascade of various enzymes, which then initiate what they call acetylation or methylation of histones in DNA and affects the transcriptions of proteins that are built into making enzymes and structures of the body and therefore alters physiology. So when we have a balanced orientation and we have neither prey nor predator, but we have a balanced orientation, which is known to be maximizing our wellness factor and use stress, which is wellness promoting, uh, we don't have these epigenetic alterations uh, occurring, which with these cascades impact physiology and we create symptomatology to let us know that we have an imbalanced mind. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a balanced physiology with an imbalanced mind. And so the symptoms that are being induced act as feedback loops back to our conscious mind through the symptoms. So we become aware that we're skewing and subjectively biasing our perceptions in favor of the prey over the predator or predator over the prey. If we were to receive prey without predator, we would get fat and gluttonous. If we receive pre predator without prey, we'd be skinny and starve and get eaten. But if we have a balance of prey and predator, we have maximum fitness. You have just enough food to keep you sustaining, but enough of a predator to keep you not overeating, because if you overeat, you get sluggish and fat, and then the predator will eat us. So our biological subcortical area of our brain, our, our amygdala particularly, is responding as a desire center, desiring one side, trying to avoid the other. But in fact, we need both sides to grow. And we, we balance our mind, our perceptions. Um, we balance our neurochemistry and balance our physiology and balance our genetic expression and bring about wellness. So anytime we have an imbalanced perspective, we will create symptoms in our body as a feedback to guide us, to let us know that we're imbalanced. We're not seeing things as they are. We're seeing things with our subjective bias and distortion. And so our psychology affects our physiology. Now I'm being generic, 
but the ratios of those perceptions, the more polarized and extreme those ratios, the more we digress into primitive embryological receptors and, and expressions. And the more balanced we are, the more we move towards wellness factors and more advanced progressions. Mm -hmm. So the beauty, the beauty of the body is it's really brilliantly orchestrated. Uh, and, and when we have a balanced mind, we have a balanced physiology. Our suprachiasmic nucleus uh, organizes all of our cell cycles, daily night cycles, and our enzymes function at appropriate times, in time with need, as we say in chiropractic. Our hypothalamus keeps the autonomic in ba ba state balanced. Our pineal keeps those day and night cycles balanced. Uh, and our epigenetics are balanced. So a balanced mind does affect and bring about a balance in physiology. In chiropractic, we called it adjustment. Adjustment means to center, just mean into balance, and met means the mind. Mm. And so we would make an adjustment of a subluxation, which meant uh, sub meant less than or underneath. Lux meant light or intelligence that organizes the body. And an Asian means a condition of less than the full expression of life and light in the body. We know we, there's bio photons in the brain when we're in a state of well-being. Mm. And those photons do down. So there's literally enlightenment in the brain when we're in a state of balance. And so less than light, subluxation, um, orchestrating the body. When we bring adjustment, we bring it back into balance. And then we make the physiology do its job. And so, I mean, I'm being really generic when I'm saying these things, but the, it's a, in a nutshell, that's a, a general schematic. There's way more detail I could go into. Yeah, sure. General schematic. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we only have so much time, so I know you could speak like for, for hours on that, on that topic. Um, but when we would go more into like um, um, asking or like trying to find out um, how is uh, the mind affecting the different joints and um, the muscles in the body. Can you speak a little bit about, about, about that? Yes. Um, most people are familiar with the muscles of facial expression. The smile, frown, the disgust, the surprise. And there's a combination of muscles that contract under different emotions. But most people are not necessarily as accustomed to the entire body being an emotional expression. But if you are having difficulty standing up on your knee and straightening your knee, you're having difficulty to stand up to authority. If you're difficulty bending the knee, you're giving in difficulty giving in to authority. The same thing if I was to ask you to say stop with your body language, you put your hand up like this and say, go ahead, go ahead. You flex the hands. Mm. If I said to you, I can't grasp it, you'd have difficulty grasping. Your wrist would be affected and hands would be. And holding on to things, grasping things and bringing them towards you and receiving things. Each joint has a lot to do with the psychology, just like the facial expression. But most people don't put the impression on that. They're not reading the body. A chiropractor is more attuned to that and is paying attention to that. And so they use that information to help the patient. But, but your body, as Alexander Lowen and Ken Dykewald and others have described, is constantly revealing what's going on emotionally by the muscular tensions and compressions. When you contract a muscle, you have compression. The other muscle, its antagonist, has tension. Compression creates a net negative charge, tension creates a net positive charge in the electronics of collagen in the cells itself. And so these imbalanced chemistries or electronics affect chemistries, which then affect physiology and our tissues. So gradual degeneration, if we have chronic emotions that we don't address and don't bring back into balance. So not only do we epigenetically affect, are affected by it, but on a gross level, our neuroanatomy and our muscular system and our tissues by this electronics and this muscular contraction are trying to reveal to us consciously the feedback by our body posture. Our posture gives a lot to do and tells us a lot about how we're perceiving. If we feel overburdened and kind of weighed down, our serotonins are down, levels are down, and um, we feel like we're not seeing things on the way, we're seeing things in the way. If we're feeling more up and back and extended and externally rotated, we feel more on the way. So our, our physiology, down to each joint, down to the spinal segments, 
down into the bones themselves the, and, and how they embryologically develop reveal a lot about the psychology because the, the dermatomes of the skin, which are the different nerve segments represented in the skin, the bone segments and the myomeres, the my, muscle segments, are related embryologically in the development. And so emotions at early stages of development can show up in these different myoterm, my, you know, dermatomes and myo, these, these layers of the muscle and skin and bone. And so I, I studied embryology and taught embryology and was fascinated by the correlations we were finding in some of the patients with the segments that they were having consistently problems with and what was going on that was triggered at a very early stage of development then that was initiated and compounded and then promoted further by the secondary associations made with those primary emotions that occurred earlier in their lives. Mm -hmm. So the spine, and when, you, when you're speaking about embryology, the spine is uh, very important for the rest of our body. Um, and like also, it, um, the, the better the posture or the more upright we are, um, the more we, we are probably in balance also in, in our mind. So it goes uh, both ways, right? It's yes, if, if a person, the, the curvature of the spine, according to Harrison and other models, uh, has a 60 degree curve, 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 a 60 degree curve. Hmm. And any, that's the maximum. That allows the gravity with its compression and mobility with its rotation to maximize function. Mm. And anytime those are skewed forward or backward and they're lesser or more, they have difficulty withstanding a gravitational pull or rotational mobility. And so we get rigid in our spine or we end up compression and getting scoliosis and imbalances in their spine. So our psychology is revealed in that. And we can see that on one side more than the other. If you relied on your mother more than your father, and couldn't rely on your father, for instance, it can cause a scoliosis and a change in the way you distribute your, your posture and your weight. Mm. So yeah, if a person that's uh, acutely aware of those subtleties can get information about the psychology and affecting the spine. But if the spine is not balanced, all of the neuroforamen, where the nerves come out of the spine itself, it, the, the electronics impede the nerve impulses which orchestrate and run physiology. So if you don't have your spine to line, your physiology is going to reveal it with symptomatology, and there's no way you can have maximum potential and function expressed. Mm. So I, I like to think of it as a Stradivarius, uh, you know, uh, violin. If it's not fine-tuned and it's not uh, perfectly fine, there's no way you can play a perfect symphony or a harmony on it. And so too, just like our teeth, if we don't floss our teeth, the teeth degenerate. We can't floss our spine. If our spine is not kept mobile, mobile posturally correct, people are not uh, aware of their posture and not taught the, uh, the significance of their posture and kept it proper, it eventually weighs itself down and you eventually have symptoms. And sometimes the symptoms are you're in your 60s or 70s, but it's actually been developing over 30, 40 years. Mm. And people never addressed it. They didn't even know to address it and they didn't know how to address it. They weren't taught that. Mm. We, some, some of the greatest information is not taught to the common people and they don't know that what their physiology is revealing. And the chiropractor is a specialist that can help a person prevent that from happening if they can have enough foresight to think long term instead of just immediate gratification to get rid of a symptom. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I see a lot of people, they would just start thinking about like their posture or their spine once they have pain or once they have reoccurring pain or chronic pain. Um, but what you say is that even um, before you can have maybe some milder like tensions um, in, in the body that they are not aware of, um, but they could already start um, working on, on the posture, working on all the imbalances in the, in the spine prior to the point where, where they get uh, the pain, right? The pain is just like the ultimate. Um, yes. I think I'm sure you've been in practice many years enough to know that you can see a person that comes in and you'll get a radiograph of their spine and you'll see a degeneration that's gone on probably 30, 40 years. Yeah. And they are now having symptoms, but they had an injury 35 years ago. And you can pinpoint usually within a year or two when that injury occurred by the de de degree of degeneration. Mm. And we would say, you know, I'd have a patient come in and they have spurring in their neck and degenerative joint disease and, you know, collapsing of discs and everything else. And I'd say, uh, 38 years ago, you were in some sort of injury where you had a acceleration injury to the side and forward. 
and they looked and they go back and they go, wow, I've, I, I now realize that I was, yeah, I, we got hit from behind in a car accident. I forgot all about it. And they didn't think it was a big enough deal at the time to do anything about it. And there was no major symptoms, just some tension and compression, but nobody ever adjusted it and put the bone back in proper place and allowed the musculature to go back into normality. And they didn't address the psychology of that injury. And so it degenerated. And now, 40 years later, 38 years later, they're paying the consequence for being uninformed and, and no one's educating people on that except the chiropractor. Mm. And, and, and people don't realize to go in, it's like your teeth. You know, People are now aware after a hundred years that if you don't take care of your teeth and you don't floss your teeth and clean your teeth, you'll get gum disease. And, mm. and then you'll end up having problems that you can't, you know, you may have to have uh, artificial teeth put in or whatever, post and things. And that's costly. And the amount of cost it takes is really, it could be done cheaper by being preventive. But uh, people don't know that. But now dentistry is aware of that. It's been educating people. And it's our job as chiropractors to educate people publicly on their spine. Because a tooth you can replace pretty easy compared to a spine. Spine, you've got a permanent problem and it can affect your, the rest of your life. And so having regular checkups from the, the chiropractor is just as essential as having regular checkups from the, the yeah. dentist. Same exact thing. Yeah. And I think it's even worse sometimes, um, even like when people have pain, um, now they came up with some studies where they say like, you can um, say that there's actually the, the, uh, the spine, the misalignment in the spine that is, that it's um, responsible for the pain. They say, um, like studies have, have proven that uh, the posture and the spine, uh, people with, with spinal imbalances and with posture problems, they don't have pain. So it can't be um, the cause of pain because why do they? Well, have pain? I, I, I think anybody with common sense in any chiropractor who's worked with patients knows that that's, that's erroneous. Mm. But um, it's, it's, funny, it's, it's funny how people um, make, you know, because somebody has adapted in a spine and they can take a picture of it and there's an occasional person that can have a spine that is misaligned and have little or no pain at that moment, mm. they can conclude that that has nothing to do with it. That's, that's ridiculous. Mm. Anybody who studies uh, bone physiology knows that anytime you put compression or tension on a bone that is not normal uh, pressure, you alter by Wolf's Law the trabecular patterns and the pattern development of the bone and the, the, you know, the canals that are in the bone and the structures of the bone. And that causes electronic changes in the nerve conduction. And the nerve conduction, it, you may not feel pain. Pain may be the last thing you'll feel, mm. but you're already having degeneration and alteration in nerve fiber things and organs and cells are, are, are already degenerating. And the pain is after it's already caused so much cha challenge that there's ischemia and there's death of cells and, and injury to cells. So just because a person doesn't have pain temporarily with an imbalance of the bone, doesn't mean that it's not causing disease and eventually going to lead to the pain. And that's what, that's misleading. Anybody that publishes something like that is a misleading individual that has a bias because they don't understand long-term physiology. Anybody with common sense that studies physiology would know that that's erroneous. Yeah, I agree. Um, so like, what, how do you think is pain created then? Um, and what in, uh, impact uh, does, Uh, the placebo effect and the nocebo effect have on, on people and how can, how can people well, um, take advantage of the placebo effect? There's many different theories about pain. The classical uh, neurological model of pain is that you have uh, free C nerve endings that are being stimulated uh, from some sort of ischemia or damage to a cell and an inflammatory response. And those nerve endings send signals up into the thalamus. The thalamus um, has signals from previous associations made with it that can accentuate or retard that, and they can go up into the conscious mind and you can feel pain. But it's really in the thalamic area that it's being responding. And uh, if, you know, anybody who's injured themselves and bruised themselves walking in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something like that and hitting their shin will immediately rub on their leg and they'll stimulate mechanoreceptors, which are little fibers that Are, have larger diameter neurons and they can beat the pain endings going into the brain and shut down the brain by a kind of a Melzack wall gate theory. 
and we've all done that. We've all gone, ah, mm. and, and, and then said maybe, maybe a few cuss words or something like that, which releases endorphins, by the way, and mm. shuts down the pain receptors because the endorphins go onto the pain receptors before the pain is in, in, infected. So we know that those are a pathways in the brain. We also know that there's chronic glial pain that are accentuated by glial cells in the brain. And we also know that the associations we have can accentuate or retard the pain. So if I sit down and if you know that uh, George Clooney is about to sit next to you and you've got the hots for George Clooney and you're in pain, you'll pretend like it's not there because you don't want to make yourself look like a weakling in front of him. Mm -hmm. But if you think that your, your mother's there, you might accentuate the pain because you want some attention. So we know that psychology can do that. We also know that if we, uh, I've had many patients, I'm sure you've had patients where uh, they've had, uh, you know, maybe lumbar and radicular algae, they had pain down their butt and their leg. And I said, well, if we don't get well by, by Thursday, we're going to have to go and have surgery done. And mysteriously, they're well by Thursday because they don't want the, the aggravation of surgery. And we would tell them something worse would happen if they don't get better. And then they would suddenly get better because they had now a motive to do it. So we, we know there's no septive and, and the nocebo effect. And we also know the placebo effect by what we say to people. Mm -hmm. uh, many people you've come into our office, I'm sure you've seen them, that look like they have a laminectomy and their skin has been sutured. Mm -hmm. But when you go down and look at the spine, there's no laminectomy. They paid for one, but they didn't get one. And I tell the patients, well, you, you, you claim you have a laminectomy, but there's your lamina there in your spine. There's no laminectomy. Somebody pretended to give you a laminectomy, sewed up the skin, gave you a result for six years. You didn't have pain. Be grateful for that. Well, but I paid for a laminectomy. He didn't give it to me. I said, be grateful. He gave you a placebo effect. Because our mind has an impact on the ratios of transmitters, which are what cause pain in our mind. And um, Anaxagoras, 2005, almost 600 years ago, said that any imbalances in perception can impact the ratio of pain and pleasure in the mind. I've had people in incredible pain went in there and found out what they represented in the brain with it, what, what was the color of it, what was the texture of it, how was it moving, this kind of thing, and then change that in their mind by asking new sets of questions, and the pain thresholds change immediately. Okay. So we know that it's a private sensation of hurt based on associations of the past, ratios of perceptions, and placebo and nocebo effects. But we also have an acute pain that comes in from an injury, and, and there's a gentleman, you know, the Iceman, who goes and stands underneath water, Wim Hof, you know, he yeah. goes in there and changes the inflammatory response. And most people are not trained on how to change their physiology. If we did, we could take pain and turn it on and off. Mm -hmm. But we just assume the external world runs our life and we don't realize what we have inside us to be able to alter that. So it's a private sensation to hurt. John Bonica, one of the leading researchers in pain from New York said that it's a private sensation to hurt based on associations of the past, perceptions of the present, and motives that we have for our future. And that's a lot of uh, truth in that. Interesting, yeah, well. Um, so if people don't have a chiropractor um, handy, can they, like, how can they empower themselves? Like, I think you, you, you've been a yoga teacher as well um, at some point in your life. And would yes. yoga or some other kinds of like um, exercises um, to increase flexibility, mobility in the body, um, help people as well um, as far as like their, their spine alignment and uh, the pain goes but then at the same time can, can it have an effect on their mind and their conflicts that they have with other people as well? Unquestionably I, I started doing yoga at 17 I'm 65 now so I've been doing it a long time but uh, yoga uh, what it does is it takes flexion and balances it with extension internal rotation, balance of the external rotation, abduction with adduction, it's trying to balance out the, the, the expression of muscles. That also uh, impacts psychology because if we're elated and excited, we tend to extend, externally rotate, open up. Mm. And we tend to be de depressed, we tend to internal rotate, flex, and close in. And so if we use those muscles and keep those symmetrically balanced, it tends to balance our emotions. So yoga can affect and help us help us emotionally balance ourselves. But it can also keep the muscles balanced, which helps the spine. The problem is that not everybody's going to be a consistent yogi. 
And so they may, and they may also have had injuries that they don't know how to actually put back into proper place. And even yoga sometimes needs assistance because it, mm. it's larger muscles, not the micro muscles that the chiropractor has to go in and, and, and repair, and refer, and rebalance. But the, the two together are very, very valuable. I had patients that were yogi students and I used to go to classes, yoga instructors and go and educate them on the spine and vice versa and encourage people to do both. Because I think that way they have a, a bit of accountability along with the chiropractic to help them sustain themselves in a balance. And obviously balanced nutrition plays a role and balanced perceptions play a role. They mm. all work together. You can't separate any of them. Yeah. The ones that give you power, um, you want to you incorporate because then you have less need for somebody on the outside. But even so, the, the probability of getting through life without having subluxations or imbalances on a micro level at a segmental level um, is very improbable. I'd, I've never seen really any spines that don't have something going on by mm. the time they're 30 or 40. They may have young children that may, but even then I see that because they fall and they tumble and they injure themselves and then, then no, one, no one pays attention to them and parents say, well, get up and let's just stand up and go again. And there's a lot of resilience we have. But I think having an evaluation on the spine um, uh, it's really revealing <laughs> yeah. because I don't think people realize that they have problems in the making and they have to wait till they're later until they get symptoms. And it's why wait for symptoms? Why have the wisdom of the ages with the aging process when you can have the wisdom of the ages without it? That, yeah. uh, it? Foresight always does better than hindsight and planning and having a strategy and a consistent incremental thing, just like building wealth. If you do a little bit of building wealth every single week and every single month, you become fortunate. If you wait till the 70 and then decide, oh, I got to save a whole bunch of money to become wealthy, the probability is low. The same thing with health. If you do a little incremental thing every, every consistent week and month, you're going to end up having a sustainable outcome that gives you well-being, just like wealth. And uh, people sometimes wait until their symptoms and they don't realize that the subtle symptoms are there all along and that they've never been trained on how to interpret the subtle symptoms. But the facial expression, the body posture, uh, the pain systems, uh, mobility, and, and, you know, somebody can have a stiff joint and they got, they'll they think it'll go away and they don't realize it. And then they become so accustomed to it, they don't realize that that stiff joint is now caused an imbalance or is an imbalance of musculature and it's affecting their psychology. Anybody that's got a back that's, that's feeling really vulnerable will mm -hmm. feel older. <laughs> they'll feel older, they'll feel less confident, they'll feel, and, and they don't realize that sometimes until they experience it and then they realize that that's affecting their aging of their mind and they're, they're they're having less confidence to set goals less confident to go out and be extroverted and go and make a difference in the world so checking your spine um, does impact literally every area of your life yeah i love it um so so then you you would say that like for example if, if i would um go to a um, physical trainer personal trainer or something and he's working on my shoulder um, and improving the mobility in that shoulder, releasing some tension there. Um, and then I go back home and it, it might be that uh, the relationship to uh, that I had a conflict before with my spouse or whoever it is, um, can like I have a different perception um, because I, um, the, the muscles are released and then that's changing the, the relationship to that person as well. Well, they're, they're reciprocal. Um, if you're, I've had people, I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. People have multiple injuries on the same side of the body repeatedly. Mm. And then they have an issue with their spouse and let's say their husband and they have problems on the right side and it's constantly showing up on the right side and they've had problems with their father and now their spouse is reminding of their father and there's issues on the male side of their body, their left hemisphere to the right side of the body crossing over and, and it's affecting that area. There's patterns there. So if we go in and do work on the physical body, it impacts the psychology. But at the same time, if we go and resolve the psychological stresses there, it helps the physiology. I tell people to do both. I tell people, I give them my Martini method to dissolve the emotional baggage. And that helps the body and the spine because I have people every week in my breakthrough experience pro program have physiological changes from doing a change in the mind. But I've also seen in chiropractic when I've adjusted people, they now have a different attitude and resilience towards their relationship. I've seen them reciprocate. So I, I, I would say you, you hit them from both angles and learn how to master both angles. You learn how to master your mind. You learn how to 
master your, your physiology and you learn how to have somebody else who you can't see. Because sometimes we can't see our own things. Other mm. people can see them. You know, we, we're, we're the last to see stuff because we have our own subjective bias and pride that blocks us from seeing things in our own life sometimes. So having a chiropractor who's caring uh, can confront the, the distortion that we have about ourselves sometimes and make us become aware of it and prevent the problem from accentuating over time and perpetuating and building momentum into eventually a chronic condition. Yeah. Great. Um, so also there's a lot of people working on the, um, the sensory input, for example, like they say, um, it, it's called neuroathletic training uh, right now where a lot of, um, neurologists come and, and they say, okay, if you work on your vision, um, uh, on your eyesight and your vision, how good your, your, your eyes work, um, that gives you a better, more, more quality uh, sensory input. And therefore um, your brain um, isn't that so much in that amygdala fear um, all the time. Um, do you think that's, that's like valuable as well to, to work on like the, the vision, the proprioception um, um, in yes. general in order? Yeah. George Goodhart, many years ago, who I had the opportunity just to lecture with, he was the one that founded Applied Kinesiology. Uh, he was talking about that uh, your posture has a lot to do with your image of yourself and internal representation image-wise. And also how clear your mission and what you want to dedicate your life to is. So any, I always say that the de any detail you leave out of your vision becomes an obstacle you'll face in your physiology. And anybody knows, you know, it was Phelps, the, the swimmer that basically got 22 gold medals, I believe. Mm. Um, he was able to see uh, the perfect performance in his mind and therefore his body could then follow. So if you can't see clearly your, your, where you want to go in life and how you're going to go there in the executive center through strategic planning, uh, the uncertainty and trepidations of your emotions in the amygdala will surface. And so anytime you can fore plan and strategically execute plans towards that, that you can see clearly in your mind, it's going to help your physiology and help you being wellness. Um, there is, from the executive center in the forebrain, there's fibers that go up into visual five and visual six centers in the visual cortex. And that area is involved in associations of vision. And the reason being is that when you're living by priority and you're living by what's most meaningful and filling your day with the thing that's truly most important in your life, that area of the brain sends impulses up into the visual cortex where you can see everything you need in order to get what you want. And anybody who can see that is more calm and centered and they see how to get through obstacles and they're less stressed. And it's the distresses that causes inflammatory responses and, and primitive immune reactions and, and cytokine alterations. And, and so anything we can do to clarify our vision is going to help us. That's what's nice about an adjustment. When you get a chiropractic adjustment, the chiropractor is not only doing physiological changes, but he's also, or he or she, is guiding wisely the patient to fulfill what their mission is in life. Because the chiropractors know that if the person is doing something that inspires them, they're more likely to have longer effects from the chiropractic adjustment. They know that. So anything they can do to exemplify an inspired life and to guide the person into an inspired visionary life It's going to help the chiropractic. It's going to help uh, them. They're going to live not to eat. They're going to eat to live. They're going to function with priority action. They're going to think about what they're doing. They're going to have less injuries because the executive center has orchestration and coordination and there's less injuries. The amygdala, if it's impulsive, uh, has a higher probability of having um, retaliative injury processes going on. So, so if we live by a clear vision, we definitely impact, impact our physiology. Those are the vision flourish, those without a vision perish, as I say. Yes, and ultimately that's uh, what the uh, goal of your method is as well, um, to uh, get, like, to clear up um, everything so you have a clearer vision. Um, and Well, the, the, the method is designed to take infatuation. See, anything you're infatuated with that you seek occupies space and time in your mind, it's noisy. Anytime you resent something, it occupies space, time, your mind, and it's noisy. So you don't have a clear mind. You have a noisy mind. And that noise is electronics in the brain that's firing without its opposite. It's not balanced. And the same thing for pride and shame. When you exaggerate yourself or minimize yourself, you have that noise. 
And every time you infatuate, you tend to minimize yourself. And anytime you resent somebody, you tend to exaggerate yourself. And those create imbalances of perspective and then show up in our physiology, our bones, our muscles, our epigenetics. It, it, I mean, it goes through the entire physiology. So subluxations can be induced psychologically. They can be induced physiologically. They can be induced chemically. They can be induced by uh, external toxins and things. But at the same time, we have the capacity to have amazing resilience if we just live by priority and we balance out our, our, our emotions and have our spine checked. It, we can do, we get more performance. It's that simple. There's no doubt you have more performance if you do that. When I had patients, I had a lady that came into my office many years ago, many years ago. Her name was Ann. She was 27 years old. And she was sitting in those days on a Rolodex on a phone with a little held holder shan and stand like this all day and was making calls as a broker in the financial industry. And uh, she was having neck pains, right? And she came in and she said, uh, you know, I've got neck tightness and stiffness. And I went and I did uh, radiographs. And she at 27 was already starting to cause problems in her spine. It was already storing evidence. More like a 45 to 50 year old spine because of this posture all day long, year after year. And um, so I told her, I said, here's what I'm gonna recommend. And I started adjusting her and, and she disappeared a week later because she was feeling better. And she thought, oh, I'm feeling better. I don't need to go. And then a week later, well, that week, her performance went up. Her business performance went up. And a week later, it started to subside and the pain started coming back. So she came back and she said, well, is it possible that by me adjusting the spine, could it affect her performance? And I said, absolutely. You know, if, if you're, if you're, I told her to get some uh, ear plugs and headsets, right? To, not plugs, but hear, hear earphones. And uh, so she didn't do this. And so she'd be stand up and told her to sit up straight, put a pillow in her back and, and to talk from a straight position. She'll actually sell more and be more confident if they're on the phone with her. And um, so she has become a patient, not just of me, because I'm not practicing now, but, um, but when she was a patient of myself and now another doctor in Dallas, Texas, now going on 37 years. And she doesn't come in there for symptoms. That's not her primary reason. She's coming in there for performance. She wants to maximize her performance in her business because she, this lady lives next door to Ross Perot, who was running for president many years ago. And she's a very wealthy lady today. And she will attribute it to having her spine checked, confirmed, and keeping it proportional and balanced and mobile. So yeah. we saved her. Uh, what, if, if she had never done anything like that and didn't know and just had chronic problems, she would probably be an invalid today. So I know we prevented that in her life and she was smart enough to get that at an early age. Well, and it can sometimes be that simple. Just use uh, some earphones instead of uh, being like that all the time in the posture. And it also has an, um, the posture has an effect on your breathing patterns and uh, like how well, how deeply you can breathe. And uh, you'd be surprised and well, you wouldn't be, but people would be surprised by how many people breathe up here, clavicular. Mm -hmm and they have tight shoulder loose abdomen syndromes instead of breathing diaphragmatically, and they have a tight abdomen loose shoulder syndrome. Yeah. And I try to tell people that if you want a tight abdomen, uh, doing workouts and sitting up is one thing, but the way you're breathing is destroying it because you're using your clavicle. Say there's three phases of the breath. I don't know if they can be seen. There's an abdominal phase, which is forward. And then there's a thoracic phase, which is outward. And then there's the last phase, which is up. And when people breathe up above without breathing down below, they don't get diaphragmatic excursion and they don't get a lot of oxygen. And then they're wondering why they're fatigued. And then they have tight shoulders, fatigue, and a weak flabby abs. And they, then they go try to work out for 30 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever on an ab and wondering why the rest of their day is not using their abs. And it's just atrophying. And if you pr practice proper breathing um, and you, make sure that the spine is balanced and your reflexes are balanced for the diaphragm. You'd be amazed and taught how to breathe properly. Chiropractic has been teaching people how to do that for 125 years, 30 years almost. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, I know you've been speaking about uh, giving up um, a breathing method where you would uh, balance your, bre your breath, where you would say like breathe in seven seconds and then uh, hold yes. the breath and then seven seconds because it's also about balance. Like you don't want to have a too long or too strong inhalation. Um, 
or exhalation, but you want to have a balance, right? It's well, if a person's depressed, they breathe like this. They have big gasps, and then they go, and long exhalations. Mm. And if they have long, if they have uh, ex excited and elated, they have long inhalations and short exhalations. And if they're balanced, they're balanced. I, right before this interview, I was doing a webcast into Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, there's a professional uh, expert there as a physiologist, it's respiratory therapist, and uh, a PhD in respir is respiration. And uh, we're going to be doing some collaboration next month on this. Very brilliant gentleman on how breathing affects physiology and psychology, without a doubt. The ancient yogis have known this for centuries, but our modern physiologists have grasped it now. And what's interesting is Anybody who's done chiropractic knows that as they get adjusted and all of a sudden their thoracic spine is loosened and their upper cervical of three, four, and five that go to the diaphragm are relaxed and down to T1, uh, T12 and L1 where the, you know, the, where the diaphragm unites stack down there. If those things are mobilized and the diaphragm's working, your energy level goes up. And people go, well, how can I go to the chiropractor? My energy's now back. And I said, well, because, and then the people who don't eat late at night and heavy and lie down, which causes hernias and gastric problems, if they eat light at night and they don't lay down immediately and they get their spines adjusted and they practice proper breathing, it's like their life is back. They got their energy back. They feel like they're younger. They feel a uh, tremendous uh, empowerment and they don't realize that they just were just so many people are not taught applied physiology, not taught this. And that's why I like chiropractic, because even in medicine, they don't do that. They give you a pill. They're pharmaceutical reps, and they don't educate people. And that's why I like chiropractic. It's why I chose chiropractic as my field, because I, I believe that people can prevent issues and be educated on people. Because I think a doctor is a teacher and, and cause themselves a, a, a longevity factor without having to, you know, go through the chronic degenerative systems if they just educate themselves and they get proper care. Yeah, I agree. Uh, many people don't, don't even know what they can do, but then there's other people who like heard about all this um, healthy things they can do. So they know like that they could um, have a, a better diet. They know that they can do some, some breathing exercises and uh, some yoga, but then in the end they still don't do it. Do you have, um, um, maybe just a hint how they can prioritize um, and stick with what um, what they can start with, to, like in order to um, improve their health, and then like work well, on from there. Yep. Every human being has a set of priorities that they live their life by, a set of values, things that are most important, least important. Not everybody's going to have health at the top of their list, and you can't expect them because some people are dedicated to focusing on their kids, some are dedicated to business, some are wealth, some are spirituality. There's all different types of areas that people focus on. And usually do, people don't put a focus on their health until they've had a health issue. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they go, oop, time for me to do something about it, which is sometimes a little bit late. But um, if you ask the question, how is, let's say your highest value is building a business. And then what you do is you go and ask, how is maintaining mobility keeping a balanced breathing, uh, eating wisely, getting regular checkups from the chiropractor, um, how is that going to help your business? If you see how it's going to help you in your business and your highest value is business, you have a higher probability of doing that. Mm. Anything you link to what's highest on your value, you have a higher probability of spontaneously doing it. Anything that's not linked and is low on your values, you're not likely to do it until a crisis occurs and then forces you to do it. And then only temporarily until you get out of symptoms, that's the problem. So my advice is to take the action steps that have been proven to help people in well-being and health and to link them to what is truly valuable in your life and ask how is doing those actions going to help you get what you want. Once you see it, you'll make them part of your daily routine. And once it's a habit, you don't think about it. You know, most kids don't, kid, don't uh, brush their teeth without being reminded until they have to kiss a girl <laughs> or kiss a guy. Mm -hmm. And at age whatever the age they start kissing, 12, 13, 15, whatever it is. Now they do it automatically. They don't want to, they don't want to kiss them without, with bad breath. So they're going to brush their teeth. They're going to floss. They're going to do everything else because now they have a drive to do it. So, but many times they've already allowed their teeth to degenerate for a few years before they got to the importance of that. Well, if you wait until you're symptomatic, 
you probably have lost a lot of time and momentum. Just like if you wait until you're 60 years old and go, oh crap, I didn't save money. I'm, I don't have any savings. You've lost the opportunity to build financial independence. Or let's put it this way, it's certainly gonna be a lot difficult now at 60 to, to build up enough wealth and compound it to, to do it. So don't wait to the aging process to do the things that prevent it. Uh, start young. And that's by asking quality questions that help you see the link between the daily actions that are proven to work. Um, I was just uh, flying in from Tokyo yesterday evening, and um, there were two people on the on the plane that came from my program in Tokyo because I just spoke in Tokyo a couple, until yesterday, mm. and uh, they were flying over to another program I'm doing here because I'm doing a program on the mind and body this week, and uh, they flew over and, and one of them uh, was had a patient of a lady named Maki who is a beautiful lady that is the one that takes me around all over Japan whenever I'm there. She's the one that you know picks me up at the airport, takes me back to the airport, organizes food and everything else. She's, she's my kind of like my assistant or escort or whatever you want to call it. And um, she, she's she been going, she's young, she's in her 30s, but she's been going to chiropractor already for five years now. And at I think 30 or 30, 29, she started doing that. And the performance and the outcome, because she's doing it now and making a habit of it, of going to the chiropractor is paying off. I mean, when she thinks of, you know, a, a chiropractor may cost you a few thousand dollars a year for, con, you know, consistent maintenance. But when you stop and think about the return on that, it's massive. Mm -hmm. We did a survey on patients many years ago, and we took income surveys, what their income was down to the, the thousands. And people ask, why are you asking? I says, well, I want to show you something. We're going we're gonna to do this survey, and then we're going to treat you for the, this next year, and we're going to then go back and look at the survey and see what's happened. See if the income has gone up because of your performance, opportunities, attitudes, and, and, and what you've learned. And we've showed on 250 patients, out of 250 patients, that the actual income increase in those 250 patients compared to the cost of all the chiropractic care of those 250 patients, they came out ahead. Wow. And, and so I, I, I tried to educate them on that, and they go, so what it's going to say in the long run, it's not going to cost you. It's going to actually save you money. It's going to, it's going to save you time, energy, money, longevity, everything else. And if I would have taken that 250 people all the way for 40 years into their adulthood, they would have seen even more impact. Mm. This is just over you know, a few years, but a long term would be even more impact because they prevented themselves from a lot of problems. It's going to be chronic things and loss of workability, um, cost at the doctors, et cetera, et cetera. So, it doesn't cost to maintain, it costs not to. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, so you, you, don't, you don't work as a chiropractor anymore, but you can help people um, with finding out what their values are and um, with all your seminars. Where can people find more about you? Um, um, well, yeah, I, I, when I started practice many years ago, 37 years now, more than that, I... Um, I realized that I was, I had built my practice and it grew very, very significantly. And other doctors wanted me to know, wanted to know how I did it, how I was helping people efficiently and how I was growing the business. I started helping other chiropractors and other health professions. And I was able to serve more people that way. And that moved me out of a clinical practice. I delegated that to doctors that worked for me. And uh, they still uh, are doing their practices and helping patients for me. And so I, I realized that I was going to reach more people and actually impact more doctors and more patients by doing what I'm doing now than I could actually in the cubicle working. So I, I don't do that now, but I'm certainly dedicated to enhancing well-being and health today by education. And if they want to, if somebody wants to reach me, they just go to drdmartini.com, just drdmartini.com, D-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-I.com. And uh, on there is just an, an educational website. It's filled with great education, hundreds of articles and interviews, radio, television, newspaper, magazine interviews, podcasts, YouTubes, you name it. Mm. Just an educational website to help, it, help people prevent their problems. Yes. Perfect. So, John, thank you so much um, for the interview. I learned, um, again, new um, stuff, and I will have to um, look over it again to really... Um, and, and take some, some notes because it was so much again. Um, and I am sure that a lot of the viewers also got a lot out of it. Um, 
and uh, yeah, they will be helped by it. So um, yeah, I wish you a great um, and inspiring mind body seminar the next days. I yes. couldn't make it this time, but uh, I have already seen you. You doing you're doing another one in uh, Australia next year, and I am very looking forward to um, joining that Fantastic. one. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it because uh, what I'll be presenting over the next five days is going to be really eye opening. I know mm. it's, it's very inspiring to work in the in this field now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Have a nice day. Okay. Have a great day and have a great holiday if I don't see you but, uh, next week, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. You too.